you. So it is, uh, it is an honor to be here. When this movie came out, it was 1995. How many of you have seen this movie, Hackers, right? And it was actually based on the culture of hacking that I was a part of. Growing up as a teenager and learning how to hack with my counterparts in the Boston area in the late 80s and early 90s. So my friends were invited to Congress over 20 years ago to explain how fragile that young internet really was. What's amazing about this is that they came together again 20 years later. I had the honor to moderate that second panel, that reunion of my friends in the hacking group The Loft. And it was interesting to hear what had changed and what hadn't. We had a lot of hopes. As hackers, we thought if we just point out all of these flaws, especially if people like Congress are inviting us to tell us about it, that surely the internet that we're building will be perfectly secure in about 20 years. Right. So we, uh, <laughs> we were young. That was, that's what young people do. Um, Joseph Mann wrote a book about our culture. It came out recently. And actually, there's even a presidential candidate among the ranks of the hackers in these early hacker groups. What's remarkable to me, as Bruce was saying, is the permeation of hackers inside of corporations and governments as we've grown up, grown older, and decided that our missions weren't really complete considering the planet is still imminently hackable. So this was me at the reunion panel and Mudge with a wig. Our hair has changed a little bit since then, but the vulnerabilities, a lot of the basic vulnerabilities and a lot of the basic things that we were trying to warn everyone about over 20 years ago are still prevalent. It only took Congress 20 years to invite me to testify, not that I'm counting, not at all. But the influence that we were able and continue to be able to wield is, as Bruce is saying, too little, there are too few of us. I don't know if you can spot me in that picture on the right. There are just <laughs> not enough of us taking the technology to the people who need to secure our systems, our society, our infrastructure. So how did this start for me in terms of infiltration into places where I would have the most leverage to change the security of the world? I wasn't the first hacker to go work for Microsoft, nor will I be the last but I was the one to launch their very first bug bounties. A bug bounty is simply paying for information about a security hole, right? If you see something, say something, here's some cash. And what was interesting about this was that Microsoft had sworn publicly a few years before this that they would never pay for vulnerabilities. Why? Because they were, and still do, receive the most vulnerability reports of any organization in the world between 150,000 and 200,000 non-spam email messages a year are sent to Secure at Microsoft trying to report a security vulnerability. So why would they start paying money in exchange for more of this, right? Well, a lot of it was orienting those friendly eyeballs of the friendly hackers towards the hard problems that Microsoft knew it needed some help with after it had ex exhausted its own internal efforts to secure its operating systems and its applications. So that's exactly what we did. What you're seeing right there on the left is the actual slide that convinced the head of Internet Explorer back in 2013 to pay hackers to report bugs to him. And the reason he was convinced by this slide was that the white graph, the low number, or the low little squiggly line there, is how many critical vulnerabilities were reported during the IE10 beta period. Beta period is when you want all of those bugs to be reported. We had a whole bunch of friendly hackers who were already reporting bugs to us. So why were they waiting to that giant white spike? Why were they waiting until after the beta period? Well, we had inadvertently given them an incentive to wait. Before we offered any cash, the only thing we offered was recognition. And so they could only be recognized if they waited until the beta period was over for the chance for their name to appear in a Microsoft bulletin. 12-point aerial font was their prize, right? So we had inadvertently trained them all to hold on to the bugs until the worst possible time to tell us, which is right after we had shipped the final version of the product. 
So this was a traffic shaping exercise. We knew what the hackers wanted. We knew we could give it to them if we simply offered a bug bounty at the beginning of the IE11 beta period and we shifted that spike of incoming bug reports working with the hackers. Well, that's great. That's wonderful. That allowed us to work in tandem with the hackers and find other vulnerabilities that were deeper in the code in areas where we still had time to fix it during the beta. It was win-win for everyone. And this, this particular conversation was one that I had the privilege to have in front of some folks who worked at the Pentagon. When I gave a guest lecture at Harvard, uh, somebody was sitting in the audience, Michael Solmeyer, he was in the office of the Secretary of Defense at the Pentagon, asked me to come brief the Pentagon, and that began the road where we hadn't just hacked the planet, we hadn't just hacked Microsoft, because this was definitely a hack, a hack of a different sort, but we hacked the Pentagon. So three and a half years ago, we launched the very first bug bounty program of the United States Department of Defense called Hack the Pentagon. And a few months later, we launched the ongoing vulnerability disclosure program of the entire US DOD. Now, if you notice some of these numbers here, the number of people who registered to participate blew us away. We had no idea that so many hackers were willing to help the DOD. Now, a few of them gave me a hard time on the internet. A few of them said things like, you know, uh, we, we don't want to pre-register with our social security number to the government. Okay, a few of you know what a social security number is in the United <laughs> States. Um, the government gives you that number. So, they, they, they know, and, um, and it's with your real name, you know, the one you were born with and everything. So, yeah, so there was a lot of, you know, trust issues to overcome with integrating this new voluntary workforce who had never before invited, had never before been invited to hack the Pentagon, right? Um, but I also call attention to a couple of other numbers. If you look at the number of reports and the number of valid ones, you can see the signal to noise ratio was not so good. It's actually quite a flood of issues. Now, a lot of that were, those issues were not bugs, but a lot of them were duplicates. So what that means is if you have a lot of duplicates, that means you probably had some lower hanging fruit. Multiple people were able to find it using common tools and techniques. So what does that really uncover, right? The truth really hurts. So there are a lot of areas in security in the last 20 years that have gotten way better. So I'm not here to say it's all trash, just vulnerability management, that part is trash. So it's really hard to keep up. We are swimming in mountains and mountains of new vulnerabilities, and guess what? Just this whole idea of keep patching, no one is keeping up with this. This is not a scalable solution. So how did we get here? One word. Marketing. We got here from a lot of marketing, great marketing over the last 20 years in this security industry that I've been a part of. A lot of silver bullet solutions. If you just have a firewall, if you just do this, if you just rotate your passwords every 30 days or something obnoxious like that, none of those things actually turned out to be great advice, right? We found out. But really, where we are with this is that we are still struggling to apply these patches even when they are available. Us hackers, when we first thought, if we just tell them what the flaws are and get them to create patches faster, that'll do it, that'll solve our problems. But no, the actual downloading of the patches and installing them turns out to also be important. How many of you have postponed those installs and those reboots on your phones, on your laptops and everything? Imagine that at a global exponential scale of the internet. And that's why you have wormable bugs still today, 20 years after we thought everything was gonna be fine. So what do you do? Do you just invite more hackers? Just open the front door, hope for the best? Could go okay, I suppose. Maybe a little bit of a rush, a little bit of a flood. But actually, it's a little bit more like this. You know, you're not sure who the attackers are versus the friendly folks. You're not sure whether your incident response team needs to get mobilized, and if they do, are they actually are you taking away resources from a real incident when you're trying to respond to a friendly hacker who's just testing your security? There's a lot here in terms of data privacy. 
If you haven't thought all of those issues through, you're gonna be in for a bad time when you invite a bunch of hackers to test your security. Don't even get me started as to how it's going to be if you can't handle the vulnerabilities you know about now as to when machine learning and AI will enhance vulnerability discovery capabilities well past the point for you to be able to keep up in an organization. And this, isn't, this is the ubiquitous you. This is all of us in society. So even if you get a lot of bugs, turns out there's a problem with that. Somebody actually has to fix them. I know this sounds crazy, this, this logic that I'm applying here, but I created a maturity model for vulnerability management. And if you notice, only one of the capability areas is in engineering. And we'll get to why this is important in a minute. What this really means is I am a hacker. I will always be a hacker. But at a certain point, we have to expand what we think about when we think about recruiting and the labor market when it comes to cybersecurity. It's not all jobs for hackers. It's not all about pointing out bugs and romanticizing the zero days. You know, most hacks are actually a result, and most breaches are a result of phishing. We don't see headlines about phishing. We see headlines about zero days, those vulnerabilities for which no patch is yet available. We see headlines for worms. So our opportunity here is that there's a huge cybersecurity workforce shortage, and guess what? It's not all in attack. Most of it is in that, you know, if you caught that, that reference to Lucy and Ethel from the I Love Lucy show, it's a lot of Lucy's and a lot of Ethel's back in that chocolate factory that have to deal with not just the vulnerabilities that they discover themselves, that other people report to them, that affect them in their supply chain, in their software and hardware supply chain, but they also ideally have to incorporate what they've learned about each bug to never make that mistake again. I mentioned this number earlier, how Microsoft receives so many bug reports, and the year I joined, 2007, we were named in popular science as the top 10 worst jobs in science. It was between elephant vasectomist and whale feces researcher. <laughs> we made t-shirts, of course, as one does. That's the only way to deal with uh, having that job. But the point here is that this labor market for bug hunting versus bug fixing versus code writing is skewed. And we have an opportunity to fix it to turn it around, and to shape it the way that will actually help us progress so that 20 years from now, if I am invited back as a blue-haired old woman, I will not be saying the same things, that our bug problem is outpacing our ability to fix it. One of the things I told US Congress, because you always have to tell Congress to do something when they ask you to come and testify, they want to hear from you, and then you're supposed to tell them what to do. So what I said was, the fact that publicly funded universities in the United States, and certainly around the world, but I was at US Congress, um, have a problem where there aren't requirements for security even when you graduate with a computer science degree. Now, I think there should be security course requirements for graduating with any degree, frankly, but I would settle for it for computer science degrees. And you know, seven out of 10 of those <coughs> universities, or three out of 10 of those universities actually don't even offer an elective in security. So we're cranking out not code writers, but bug writers. We are missing the root cause. The fact that I retired as a professional hacker a dozen years ago, and yet some of the same techniques, the same classes of bugs, and the same kinds of hacking skills that I possessed back then still work today, that to me is an indication that we need to shift our labor focus in this industry. So what are we gonna do? We're absolutely going to start hacking ourselves. We must, right? Hack ourselves first before asking strangers for help. Balancing the labor equation in terms of what to outsource, what's appropriate, and what is important to do yourself. And then balance that labor workforce. Every culture has an idea somewhere between the balance of creation, maintenance, and destruction. I love the destruction part. I was born a hacker. Every screwdriver in my house had to be removed by my mom. But the fact of the matter is, we're not going to have very much to hack if we don't start fixing things, and I mean fixing broken process. I would be remiss if I did not leave you 
with a thought. Not just the labor workforce, the type of work that is done, but who is doing the work. Very important for us to reach outside of the traditional tech channels that are mostly male and still mostly white. The folks on these slides, there's a woman there who's a nurse. She's one of the best advocates for, um, for healthcare and medical device security. The woman there is taking a selfie. That's her daughter picking a lock. She was homeless when she was pregnant with that child. So my point here, as I've run out of time, is that when we look at the world that we have hacked, what is left for us to do? We can keep hacking it forever, but we have to find people who are there to secure it, and it has to be all of us. Thank you.